I know a lot of atheists, they don't believe in gods. But what about ghosts? The spiritual other, the unknown. Ah, there are many atheists who do believe, and I find this fascinating, and I myself would like to believe. It's like that Fox Mulder poster in the X-Files. I want to believe. And uh, I love ghostly things, but I want to talk to a, what I call you a debunker. I would not. I would call me a just an investigator. That that's all. Because as far as I'm concerned, debunking is the result of an investigation. Um, that's when you get all your data together and you come to your conclusion based on that data. And it says, "Hey, you know what? The the original claim is false." And that's what debunking is: taking the falseness out of a claim. So, so I, if you I say wouldn't... debunker, it's essentially you're com you're broadcasting that I'm front loading that I think this is bunk. Right. Where right. you want to be more of a neutral observer. Yes. You know, it's it's no different than calling someone a believer. If you just go in and say, well, you're just a believer, you know, and, and I get the same thing. You're just a debunker that and, and I don't those terms are automatically setting a bias. It's already setting you up that you're on one side or the other. And and like you said, I just want to go in neutral. I want to be Switzerland, you know, <laughs> go in yeah, there. I was telling somebody, though, Kenny, I was telling somebody that I was going to talk to you and they believe in spirits and stuff. And they were like, well, you know, they're not going to find anything because they don't I mean they may say that they're, you know, they're open and they just want to find evidence if there is. And they're genuinely curious. But, you know, deep down there, they think it's all a bunch of crap. And I'm sure you've heard that, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? And you're for those people, I, I say you're making an assumption for me. You're, you're speaking for me. And um, you, you really can't do that uh, because I know me better than you do. So. For me, I'm fascinated with the entire idea of the paranormal, ghosts and monsters and UFOs, everything that goes along with that. I'm fascinated and I would absolutely love to find something genuine and 100 percent like this is proof of the afterlife. That would be great. I, I would love that. Unfortunately, every investigation I go on does not conclude that way. And it's not because of me. It's because that's where the data leads me. Now, why are you stealing my joy? When I go to the Conjuring movies and I see the Warrens, they just seem so real and credible to me. And uh, I'll get to the Warrens. Really? Right, just, <laughs> I'll get to the. No, I'm just. I'm full of I crap. Know, I'm just. I'm just blowing smoke. Uh, let's do a, a formal introduction. Kenny Biddle. You may have seen his uh, work as featured in Skeptical Inquirer. You still run in the blog. I know you've got the podcast. Kind of tell everybody who you are. So, yeah, I, right now, my, my current position is the chief investigator for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And before that, I was and, and still do. I host a show called the Skeptical Help Bar every Friday night. It's a live show. Um, I also do videos for this Center for Inquiry YouTube channel called Ghosts in the Machine. And that's videos. Basically, it's the same idea of my articles in Skeptical Inquiry. It's basically taking like ghost hunting equipment or uh, I, I take it apart. Or I go out to locations that are alleged to be haunted or have a Bigfoot and, you know, you follow me along. I take you along on the adventure and I do lectures. I have spoken at science conferences such as SciCon uh, about solving mysteries. I have a whole strategy that I follow that I try to teach during workshops. And uh, that's it. I mean, I started as a ghost hunter. I was a ghost hunter in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, I transitioned over to the skeptical side of the fence oh so. come on kenny you can't throw that out so i mean are you like those guys at ghost adventures where you're like the temperature just dropped 15 degrees i saw an orb in the camera and the reason i'm doing the accent is because i have been and this is not an uh, insult to you kenny but i have come to the conclusion that the people the experts who go on television to investigate are just as thick as a post. Like these are the least qualified people possible. I don't know. So what's a ghost hunt look like in your, I don't know, your ghostly past? Oh, so yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I mean, it, it's embarrassing now to talk about it, but it, it's 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 important to talk about it. So yeah, I was basically what you saw on TV. I went in with gadgets that I honestly didn't know how to use. And I sat in the dark. I talked to the dark. I asked questions thinking ghosts were all over the place. I thought any any time I got a shiver, like felt a cold spot, that it was a ghost. That pictures of little 
balls of light in my in my images or a smoky substance going across the scene i thought was evidence of a ghost all of this stuff i i was right there with you um i got my start right before the ghost hunting shows came on at the air uh ghost hunters was actually the first show uh first modern reality show that would come on the air and i grew up with things like in search of um sightings and and shows like that where they presented all these mysteries so i wanted to do that and for me i called a local group that i found the first time i got a computer back in <laughs> in the 90s when you know like the internet was a brand new thing i i called up a group they said yeah come on out and my first and my first ghost hunt was a cemetery and uh of all things because you know by the time the people get there they're they are already dead uh so i don't know why <laughs> cemeteries are haunted but i didn't know any better so come on i mean i've seen those shows where you know they take you to one of the most i don't know creepy please cemetery it's an old abandoned asylum a prison with the electric chair or whatever i mean by the time you walk in the door aren't you just you're ramped right you're already scared before you're scared right Exactly. I mean, you, you've you already read the stories. You, I mean, I, if you look behind me, there's tons of books back, back here. And many of them are regional ghost story books that you can pick up at any bookstore or any uh, tourist trap uh, in the area. So as a ghost hunter, that's what I used to do all the time. Just as soon as I got there, it's like, all right, what can I buy? And buy, it, buy the books, read the stories, and then uh, that's where I want to go. So when you're arriving at the front door, you already believe the place is haunted. You already believe that all the gadgets that you brought with you uh, do something with uh, like either communicate with ghosts or capture ghosts or, or detect their presence. Um, and then when you gather everything up, you're so hyped up. It's like you, you drank like a dozen Red Bulls all at once and you're walking into this building and you're like, yeah, I can't wait. To I mean, I can't tell you how many times I see people preach that i can't wait to get all this evidence tonight like they're not even there yet and they already believe that they're going to get this big huge body of evidence uh that the place is haunted so yeah you walk in you set things up you're like oh you know i'm on a ghost hunt i'm in the dark and i'm with a bunch of people that i barely know and <laughs> it's got to be a bonding experience though you're all is. in the foxhole together right yeah. your tribe all of a sudden yeah, you're 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 part of a group, you know, and and everybody shares their beliefs. And as soon as something weird happens, it's it's not during my ghost hunting days, and even today when I go out, because a lot of times I go and with a, like pay to play events where I pay a few dollars and I attend an event, a ghost hunting event with a group, and they teach you all the stuff that they they do. And when you're sitting there in the dark and something weird happens. It's not usually a, a, hey, let's investigate and see what caused that noise or that that shadow down the end of the hall. It's, I think that's a ghost. And then everyone else chimes in. Oh, I think so too. Oh, you know what? That's where the ghost is supposed to be seen. Like people have seen that before. And they justify it. They convince themselves that what they experienced was a ghost without actually investigating it. And that's what I did. I, I used to do that. Um, I mean, truth be told, I just, I didn't investigate. I didn't fact check. I didn't check up on what I was doing and I didn't bother to find a source. I just believed. And that was my problem. <laughs> You've mentioned the gadgets a few times and I want to talk about the tools of the trade, but I, I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer, but when I was watching the scariest places on earth and ghost hunters, et cetera. I just couldn't help but think that one of the production assistants ran in the other room and threw like a piece of lead pipe on a concrete floor to make a sound, right? And I staged, come on, did you ever get the vibe that, you know, someone's yanking our chain? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't speak for all of them. And, and I, again, like I have not been on set. Uh, I'm not one to get invited onto the ghost hunting shows. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm <strange>. always available. <laughs> strange. Uh, but yeah, I, I would see there's certain scenarios where I'm like, well, that just looks staged. Um, it, ver it very much looks staged because one camera placement, like camera placement is always in the right spot at just the right time to capture exactly what they want to capture and nothing more. 
So that's always a, a red flag for me. Um, but but uh, I, I don't know if they're all stage. I think there's a lot of misinterpretation. I also think that on some cases, um, maybe with certain shows, Ghost Adventures, um, that they <laughs> use maybe a two-way radio to make some of these gadgets go off. Uh, yeah. So a, a few of them do operate off of a, a radio frequency or are affected by a radio frequency. So if you have a like a two-way radio that you picked up at Walmart, um, you can go like in the basement or a floor above or in the next room and key it up and wave it around and it'll make some of these devices light up or, or beep. And, you know, nothing excites a ghost hunter more than when a gadget lights up and beeps. <laughs> doesn't yeah. matter what the measurement is. It's as long as it beeps. And, and I'm talking here with Kenny Biddle. I'll call you a paranormal investigator. Okay. Is that better than debunker? Yes. You have a different right. title that, that yes. works for you. Okay. I mean that that's uh, I'm my official title is chief investigator. So okay. that's what I am here at the at CSI. So that's what I go by. Tools of the trade. Now I've seen the 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 EV stuff and the white noise. Uh, I don't know. EVP. I'm doing a very poor job of um, <laughs> e I mean tell tell me what the tools are as a uh, hunter of ghosts. So you have a bunch of tools. I mean, pretty much the standard is a EMF meter. So that basically stands for electromagnetic field meter. And these meters are actual tools. I mean, you can get them in like Home Depot or you can get more uh, uh, sophisticated and accurate ones um, from science websites. Uh, but they measure the strength of an electromagnetic field. So like anything electrical will give off a field. Um, when, when power is flowing through a line, you'll get an electromagnetic field from that, that wire. And you can read that. You can measure the strength of it. And I think that is really based off the PKE meter from Ghostbusters. I honestly think that's where it came <laughs> from because you see, I, I mean, Ghostbusters was a big influence and you can actually see like above my head here, um, there's a PKE meter on the shelf. Uh, wow. But when Ghostbusters came out, that was that was in 1984. And that was before you saw all these re reality ghost hunting shows. And not many people used gadgets. Um, of course, you had like SBR. They were using uh, practical stuff like rope and powder and candles, um, stuff to check for footprints and uh, airflow through a hallway or out a window. Um, practical stuff like that. It wasn't until after Ghostbusters came out that all these gadgets started appearing with groups where they're like, oh, what can we grab that's handheld that we can walk around with and that'll give us readings? So I think, yeah, the EMF meter was the first one that came up and it really doesn't do much. Do you want us to stay here? Do you want us to go? Do you like us? Are you a male? Are you a female? There's another one called the REM pod. And I don't remember what REM, R-E-M stands for, but it's it's not anything real <laughs> or technical. <laughs> it, I think it's more of a made up word. But basically, it's a, it's a uh, uh, junior Thurman device. So a Thurman is a musical device. Uh, it works without touching it. It has two antennas. One controls the volume. One controls the the uh, the pitch or the tone of the the sound coming out of it. And it's a really cool machine. You don't actually touch it to play it. Um, you just get closer and closer to the two antennas, and it creates sounds. So a Junior Thurman is a novelty version of it. It's basically an electronics toy. And this is used inside usually 3D printed um, bodies. And it has lights. It lights up. It either plays beeps uh, at different tones or a musical, uh, like uh, some music that it plays. You can switch between the two. But the closer anything that's uh, conductive gets close to it, it starts making noises and it starts lighting up. This is one of the things that can also be used with a, a two-way radio. I can make those things go off from like two or three rooms away. Uh, so it's very easy to manipulate, just like the K2 meter. Uh, what else do we got? We got motion sensors. We got temperature guns um, that read the infrared energy coming off of uh, surface objects. Yet 
uh, and we have ghost boxes. Oh, ghost boxes are <laughs> very popular because, you know, ghost. Um, but these are broken radios. They are literally broken radios. They, they, so what they, what that does is sweep through the AM or FM band. So it sweeps through and instead of stopping on a, a station that's coming in clear, it continues to cycle through. So they disable the uh, the feature where it stops on the next available station and it just cycles through. So you're getting snippets of each local station coming through. So you can hear bits and pieces of music, news, commercials, um, any kind of, uh, of radio broadcast. And ghost hunters will make a habit of sitting around in a room with one of these boxes going off. And it, honestly, it's so annoying when you have to hear this, when you have to listen to this for like more than 30 seconds, it's so annoying. Is there anybody here with us? We have family members here and we're here to be friendly. We just wanted to come say hi and see if there was anybody here that wanted to say hi or talk or tell us something. They ask questions thinking that they are communicating with a ghost and that somehow a ghost can manipulate the radio frequencies coming into that box and create words. I, I don't know how they're supposed to well, do it. Can, wait, Kenny, who ahead. manufactures the box? Like, is that ever a question? Like, where did this come from? Who put it together? What are the components? How do we know it works? Anyone asking that question? So the first one that I remember seeing was the Radio Shack hack. And it was basically a Radio Shack radio. It was a white radio. Yeah. And you opened it up and there was one connection in the back uh, where you snipped it. And that connector was the one that controlled that when, when it started uh, uh, sweeping through the station, it would stop at the next available station. So when you snip this little uh, connector, it stopped that action. So it would continually sweep through it. And I have, I have one out in the display case here, um, out in the lobby, but, um, basically it came from that people were plugging speakers in and they were going, Hey, you know, can you tell me your name? And they were hearing different things and you're hearing, you're basically hearing phonetics. Uh, you're hearing these different sounds. And when you're, you're primed to hear something, when you're expecting to hear an answer, such as a name, that's what you're going to pick out. So in all this static, in all this clutter of different radio stations, and again, you're talking about like commercials for, um, you know, furniture, uh, for vacations, for uh, you have news uh, broadcasts that have politics and sports and, you know, the local murders that happen. All this stuff is going through this radio and coming out the speakers. So if you say, hey, what's your name? I guarantee you're going to say you're going to hear something that sounds like a name. <laughs> You're, it's almost like uh, backward masking during the satanic yeah. panic. You know, the pattern seekers in us are going to find something, exactly. and then we're going to find something that validates what we expected to find in the first place. Exactly. There's even a problem where the conversation switches depending on what the radio says. And this this is what blows my mind. You can have a group of people ask something like, hey, what's your name? And somebody will say, well, I, I just heard chair. I just heard chair. And instead of saying or, or the logical thing to me would be like, well, that's not answering my question. I asked for a name. The conversation will switch and say, well, you you a chair. What chair? That chair in the corner. Did you die in that chair? <laughs> and And that's it. Like the conversation. Just shift it, completely shift it from what they were asking to something different because the radio told them. <laughs> and I just picture you watching some of these shows and just vibrating in your chair. Like you're on the edge of your chair going, what the, <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? Ask this question. What do you do? I just picture you doing that. Do people still use divining rods? Because I was scanning yeah. the other day. And somebody, first of all, for those who don't know what a divining rod is, explain what it is and what it's supposed to do and why it's why it is bullshit. Yeah, I'll say it out loud. Go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead. So the finding rod, uh, originally they were used to find minerals uh, or water. 
uh, and people used a divining uh, rod, but it was a stick. It was a forked stick um, that they picked up <laughs> from a tree. Um, I think it was usually like birch or something like that, but they go around and he held it in a weird way, um, like in a way that promoted the stick wanting to go down because you can't hold the position. Um, and if you look at older photos, you'll see like the way they're holding it. And it's very uncomfortable, very awkward and very just dumb um, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Uh, but basically people thought they could find water sources of water underground um, or minerals. And there's, there's a historical context with this, but um, there's, a, and, and forgive me, it escapes me now, but the first person that wrote about it, I think was in the 1700s and he wrote a manual about finding minerals and he touched on the idea of divining, divining rods and dowsing. And uh, actually uh, the first paragraph of his description is used to promote divining, ro divining rods as you know something that's real. But if you actually read on the rest of the paragraphs, you find out that the author just dismisses it. He's like, no, it doesn't work. And he explains that why, uh, because you can actually find vegetation and pretty much anywhere you, you dig, you're going to find water. So he explains it, but that part is usually left out. Modern times that uh, people use two, usually like, uh, either brass rods that in, in holders and handles. So they swivel easier. So they are making it easier to, to get an anomaly here. Can you point me? towards the nearest buried silver. See how the, both the rods are pointing in that direction? That's where we're gonna walk. And the rods have crossed. Look what happens when I step back. The rods open. The rods are crossed. Now, I'm gonna walk forward, see what happens to the rods. They've opened. So, we know around this area is buried silver. So they're, they're in the handles, there are two of them, and they usually ask questions of ghosts. They think they can communicate with ghosts with this because they ask yes or no questions. And if the rods cross, that's a yes. And if they split apart, that's a no. Or you can ask for direction and the rods apparently go back and forth. Um, so that's basically what I, I see dowsing rods used for dividing rods there it's interchangeable dividing rods uh, dowsing rods all but the am same. i subconsciously like maneuvering i mean because I, I a lot of these people i think are sincere oh yeah. look it is leaning left it's right it's crossing and i don't sense and who really knows but i don't sense that they're in on it right yeah uh th th well i mean <laughs> it's a juggle it, it be really is because some people i just flat out think they know exactly what they're doing hmm. um other people yes they're they don't realize what they're doing and until you show them uh that they believe that something is manipulating a rods some time ago a friend of mine named mitch silverstein uh made a simple device and i have it here um so this is a simple device for testing dowsing rods it's two acrylic blocks and uh there's a bubble level up there you can see that that's on the lower thing uh and the handles here so these handles are the original handles for the dowsing rods. It's what comes with them. So they are locked into the blocks. So now I cannot manipulate them independently, oh, wow. uh, which is great. And if you try to tilt the whole thing first, I'll see you tilting it like a steering wheel. Um, so that that's an obvious uh, uh, red flag. But if you tilt it in any way, the bubble level will let me know uh, that you're moving it. So this locks it in place, won't let you manipulate them. and when I use these, I've used these for years now, and everyone that's tried these has not been able to get the dowsing rods to work. So for the audio podcast listener, and check me if this is right, but essentially it's a device that removes, at least to a degree, a great degree, the human element. Yes. The rods kind of pivot on top. You aren't actually holding the rods directly, uh, the pivot portion directly in your hand, and there's a level on the device to make sure that you're not sort of rotating it like a steering wheel to make the rods move. Is right. that close enough, Kenny? Yes, that's okay. correct. That's correct. And there's another method, too, uh, that I use when people are convinced that they are still doing something divine, uh, let's say. I usually set up a video camera at the level of their elbows, because usually when you're you're using dowsing rods, you're you have your arms bent like this and your forearms are straight out. 
and you're holding the rods. So when I set up a video camera level with their elbows, I get the full, I'm looking directly down their arms and I take video of them as they are, are asking questions and getting responses. And then we watch the video played back at at least double the speed. So when you double the speed, you get to see all the movements of their hands are, are greatly exaggerated. And it shows them that they are not holding their hands still, that they are manipulating them, even if they don't do it on purpose, but they are manipulating them. And once I've done that, for the most part, people realize, you know, like crap, it's me, uh, which is good. I mean, they realize it. Unfortunately, most of them still continue to do it <laughs> because, oh, yeah. you know, they get oh, paid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kenny Biddle stealing the joy, <laughs> robbing us of the awe and wonder of possibility out there. He just takes your dreams and smashes them to the ground. You yes. Sad, sad man. I'm sure you probably heard some of that. Like, I want to believe is probably a great way to put it. Well, like, it, it, I, why would you want to kill this in me? You know, I'm sure you hear some of that. I, um, I, you know what? I find joy in solving that mystery. I used to find excitement from being in a spook, spooky place and going, oh, you know, I think that's a ghost. I think I saw a shadow that probably is a spirit from somebody from like, you know, 300 years ago or something like that. I used to get excited about that. And then the more I learned, the more I realized, well, you know what? There's a reason that I'm seeing this or there's a reason I'm, I'm getting these on photographs. And I found that more exciting than the, the alleged ghost part. I love going into a place and solving the mystery, figuring out what actually happened and recreating it and saying, look, we, we solved this. We Scooby dude this. <laughs> I mean, that's what better thing. I mean, for somebody that grew up with Scooby Doo, like that's the ultimate goal. The I'm reminded of that uh, line by Hitch. And I totally agree with what he was talking about. Once you've seen the wonder of the natural world, why would you ever be impressed by a burning bush? You know, exactly. And uh, the psychology of belief. And honestly, <laughs> The real world is wonderful enough. I want to come back to the Warrens. I confess, Kenny, I am I like the Conjuring films. Well, I like the first one except for the last 10 minutes. I mean, I enjoyed it. Like, hide and clap scared the shit out of me, okay? I, I, I took the journey. But the Warrens, right, whenever people invoke the Warrens, I do die a little bit inside. Can you tell us who the Warrens are? and why people care. <laughs> well, I can tell you who they are, why they care. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe, <laughs> I don't maybe that's know. a poor phrasing of the question. <laughs> but, maybe, no. I, I, I'm, I, but I'm struck by them, right? I mean, right. I think most of this started around Amityville. Is that correct? Right. You're talking the 70s um, where well, we didn't have the internet. It wasn't easy to look up for information. So it, it really took time. You had to go to historical society, societies or libraries um, and newspaper, uh, actually, the, the, the buildings um, where you had to go and research. So there was a lot of work. It was very easy to pull off a hoax um, or just to perpetuate or, or promote a hoax. Uh, but back, back then, yeah, we had the Warrens. Um, they actually got their start with uh, little cases where they, they thought everything was demonic. Everything was demonic. And Ed and Lorraine Warren, they were a, a couple. They were a married couple. They had a museum. Uh, but I think they really started big with the Annabelle story. So apparently they had this uh, apartment. There was an apartment that was being haunted by a demon because that's the only thing that <laughs> comes up when they're involved. Um, it was a demon and it, it manipulated this Raggedy Ann doll and moved it around. And that was the story. The doll itself is not haunted or possessed. It was just this demon was using this doll to play around. And that became famous. It made the news. And I think it really propelled them um, into like this, the, the public eye. And then you had things like the Amityville house. Um, then you had the, the, um, the Conjuring House, which is a, 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 that famous movie. But I guess from a standpoint of watching a film, it was entertaining. You could watch it as a horror film. That's fine. But because it was based on a true story, and I use that loosely, um, then I look at it in a different light, and I have a problem with it. So Ed and Lorraine Warren, again, were they, they called themselves demonologists. Every time they went to a location, as soon as it popped up in the news, as soon as there was some inkling uh, that 
there was weird stuff going on in the house. They showed up, um, whether it was the Conjuring House, Amityville, Enfield case over in the UK. Um, uh, there was one in Connecticut, uh, but they were there and they weren't there to help. As far as I'm concerned, they weren't there to help. They were there to exploit. And <clears throat> they went in, they got a story, they added to the story, they embellished the hell out of the story, and then went on a lecture series and talked about it. So they charged people to come to their lectures. They would hire a writer to write a book about that story, regardless of what the family thought. They would get permission from the family to write about it, with the idea that they were going to help, that the Warrens were going to help them. And in every case, if you talk to the families, they did not help. All they did was exploit. So to me, and this is my personal opinion, that's my disclaimer, uh, they were horrible people that exploited others for their own gain. And I think they're terrible. And I and, and anybody that follows them and, and thinks they're legitimate, I think you need to rethink your entire life. Um, because it, they're just horrible people. But uh, now you segue us into the more insidious part of this. I mean, you know, you you drive over near Area 51 and you see the gift shop and you go in and get the alien figurine. Okay, great, whatever, <laughs> knock yourself out. I mean, I see, for those watching on video, I see a lot of uh, your office is like a story that would take <laughs> six months to tell because you have just so much stuff. This is just one corner. <laughs> <laughs> the you first step, well. Kenny, is to admit you have a problem. Oh, I'm I know I have saying. a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well aware of it, and, and I love it. <laughs> um, but it, it's big business and people yeah. selling hope, you know, that type of thing. You can speak to your dead grandmother or the spouse or child you lost. Uh, all we need is, I don't know, $1,000 of your hard-won or hard-earned money kind of thing. Let's talk about the dark side of this stuff. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> I want to talk about the grifters. I want to uh, talk about the people who were saying, I will come to your home or you come here. We'll have a seance. I have a crystal ball. Uh, okay. You know, so, it, it's just sort of that paranormal for profit angle that right, you started right. us down. Well, I see a lot more with psychics and mediums. Um, not so much with ghost hunters. Ghost hunters, um, for, for I guess on the positive side, they don't usually charge for anything. They, they are happy to come to your house. And, you know, hang out for a few hours and enjoy the darkness and, and talk to themselves. I mean, but did you ghost. pay? I know you recently stayed at a ghost house. Did you pay a fee to spend the night there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So in those instances where where I pay usually like 20, 30, 40 dollars, oh, yeah. most of the time the money goes back to the location. So if it's a historical location um, that is is in need of repair or something, usually that's a benefit to them. Um, the money goes back to that. Okay. Well, so, I'm going to be clear too. I'm not setting you up because I have admitted in the past and I would still do this. I would pay, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever to stay the night in a ghost house or whatever. I don't oh, see yeah. that. And that's not the same category as someone coming in and, and I don't know, being what, uh, Susan Gerbic called the grief vampire. That's a right. different thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there's places that like you, like you just said, I, I would pay just to, to be there because I like going to places that are alleged to be haunted. It's the places that I've heard about all my life, I, I would pay to, to stay overnight. I mean, that's just what I do. I also pay to go to movie locations um, because I like that. I'm a big nerd. Uh, but when it comes to uh, charging for profit. Uh, and, and again, like uh, Susan Gerbeck, that was a great uh, a way to bring it up uh, about psychics and grief vampires that come in and claim that they're going to uh, contact your, your loved ones. And they, they do it for a fee. And usually it's, it's an expensive fee, but they give this impression that they're talking to ghosts. And I just, I find that very deceitful and, and, and just dirty because you're exploiting the, a person's grief because if somebody lost a child, especially if it's a child um, or a loved one, like their wife or husband or partner. Um, and you're, you're saying, Hey, you know what? I have this little bit of hope here. I can talk to your, your deceased loved one, you know, for 49 95. Um, I can do this. And in that moment, the person is grieving. There's desperation. 
they desperately want to talk to their loved one again. You know, maybe they want to apologize or something for something they did. Maybe they want to know that it's okay. You know, they're all right in whatever afterlife they're in. Um, so they, they pay this money and this, the psychic and, or medium, usually it's a medium because that's what, you know, that that's the definition what's of medium. What's the difference? So uh, mediums are the medium before, between the living and the dead. They are the, uh, like interpreter, I guess you can like call a it. Conduit they speak, kind of yes. Thing. Okay. Uh, where psychics are ones that claim to be able to see into the past or see into the future or make predictions. If, if mediums could really talk to the dead, we should have no unsolved murder cases. We should have no missing persons. We, we just shouldn't. And, and we do. We, we have thousands of kids every year that go missing and or are killed by various people, kidnappings and whatnot. And their murders go unsolved. But yet these mediums claim that, hey, for $49.95... I can talk to your dead loved one and tell you like how much they love you. Yeah. It's yeah. I never oh. tell you where the, where the pot of gold is buried for sure. No. It's funny, Kenny. No. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm showing my hand here, but I was knowing what I know about my former evangelical past. I feel like that knowledge, if I wanted to use it in a malicious way, or if I wanted to become a grifter, I could, I could use my knowledge of how the system works to grift the system. I could go back and say I was wrong. I found Jesus uh, and then hit the circuit right at the right. end of an offering plate. And I could totally cash in because I know the system. And I look at you and I think you're a guy who was seen behind the curtain and you know how the toys work. Yet, if you were not a person of morals, you could use that knowledge to cash in. Man, you could play that you could you could literally fill it'd be like printing money in my mind. Yeah. I don't know. Can you ever think about that? Like, what if I wasn't an honest guy? <laughs> I do. Every time I I, I look at it like, like investigate a, a gadget um that's that's supposed to be talking or detecting ghosts. Because I mean, some of them most of the gadgets that I take apart, there's maybe five to ten dollars worth of parts in there, and maybe in a half a half hour or an hour of putting it together. Not a lot. And they sell this stuff for two, three, four hundred dollars each. And they sell tons of them. If I went on to a TV show and just said, hey, you know what? I'm I'm an expert. I'm an expert in the paranormal. And just said, yeah, you know, like that that it probably is old Uncle Fred haunting the attic. And and this ball of uh, of this ball of light, that's not a dust particle. That's not a bug. No, that's a spirit. And if I kept doing that and maybe, you know, made my hair all crazy, like the crazy hair guy on the alien shows, you know, and did guest spots. Or if I if I said, hey, you know, because I've done cold readings uh, many times. I've done cold readings in, in uh, college classes when I've lectured co college classes, um, humanist groups. I, I've done I've just launched in the cold readings and been able to figure out like someone's aunt passed away from a heart attack or something like that. And I mean, I, I'm not doing anything special. And I uh, honestly, I think I suck at it, <laughs> but I still get through it and convince them that I'm real. So yeah, every time I do that, I think I could be rich. <laughs> I, I could be rich. I could have, I could, I could make some good money and you my and wife I could is, hit the road. We could, we could call the two, we could broadcast our own channel yeah. and we could just go and it'd be God and ghost, baby. We, you and I would just go and print money. It would be yeah. amazing as we uh, get close to the end of our conversation. And you've been so generous with your time. Come on. Has there been anyone just way out there wacky, even if you knew it was crap, but just wacky experience you've had when you've stayed at a haunted place where you were like, this is just off the chain. Have you seen anything just crazy, even if it was human made? I saw, I guess the craziest thing that I saw was, well, heard, um, because uh, I went to a place called Whispers Estate. This was early on, uh, but I, I went there because it was famous for hearing voices. Like people didn't have to have recorders. They would start talking and, and doing their ghost hunt thing. And then sometime during the night, they would hear the voice of a little girl suddenly start singing lullabies. And it was a big deal. It, it made its rounds. It was very popular 
in the early 2000s and I got to visit. I, I was part of a, a, a podcast that was um, streaming live from that site and they invited me to go along and I was like, oh, great. You know, this is cool. I'm finally going to get there. And I'm talking to people. Uh, there was only about 10 of us in the, in the house and all of them have experienced this this singing. They all heard it. And they all thought it was great. And I'm getting pumped up. I'm trying not to, but I'm getting pumped up because I'm like, these are all people. And like all they're saying, I can't, I can't like figure out what's going on yet. And then I take a look at the stairway because it was like a, a foyer where the sounds were coming from and the main stairs were there. And it was a little, just a little area. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, well, there's a panel on the, the stairway, like the whole stair is the underside of the stairway is enclosed, but there's one panel that doesn't match. And I was like, there's something wrong with this. And I didn't want to take it apart because I didn't have permission from the owner to take up the panel off because it had screws in it and you, you would be able to take it off. So I didn't have a permission. I didn't do it. I went and did something else. And when I came back a little bit later, the, a few of the ghost hunters had taken it upon their, themselves to take that panel off. Um, which was good for me, but not for them uh, because they the owner got pretty pissed off. But we got to see downstairs and we got to see that there was a chute. Um, there was a metal chute going from under the stairs into the crawl space. And so I went down to the basement, found the crawl space, crawled up into it. And there was just enough room. If, if I sat on my butt, <laughs> I would still have to hunch over. So it was very tight. I'm crawling around. I get to this this metal chute, which I think used to be for coal. I think they used to load coal into uh, some kind of compartment and it went down in the, into the basement. But I stood up in the chute, I started talking and there was an echo and everyone stopped and they're like, that sounds exactly like the ghost girl. Like this whole echo, this metallic echo. And I was like, really? You know, and I start singing just horribly because I can't sing. But they're like, wow, you know, this really does sound like it. So that made me want to crawl around some more just to take a look. And I accidentally kicked something by one of the pillars, supporting support pillars. I kicked something. I went, looked it up. It was a speaker. Um, there was a speaker there and I traced the wire. It went around certain poles and went all the way back to the, the main basement where there was a whole collection of audio equipment. Uh, and then I found another speaker that matched it. And it was right in the same area. There was no reason why a speaker would be there, much less propped up the way it was propped up. And that, for me, was probably one of the the, the weirdest things. I was really expecting to hear this this music or the sound, the singing. And instead, I found the best evidence for a hoax going on. Um, so that probably is the weirdest. I know you were probably expecting no, something I, like a I, ghost or something. What I come but, away with with that story, Kenny, I think I would get a bigger rush from discovering I did. the charade. I did. I, I stood up. I held that speaker up like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I got the, the picture hanging around my head. Like you're like, holding Simba up yep. in front of everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, look at this, bitches. <laughs> that's <Found> hysterical. <laughs> Kenny, you're awesome. You're fun to talk to, too. Uh, send everybody to your stuff. Uh, kind of tell everybody where to find you, if you would. The easiest place to find me is skepticalenquirer.org. Um, if you look that up, look up my name, Kenny Biddle. Uh, you'll find my articles. You'll see I have a whole page of articles and then the ghosts and the machine videos that I do for them for the Center for Inquiry. Um, you can find me online uh, at, on Facebook at I am Kenny Biddle. Uh, I post a lot of stuff there. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. Uh, because TikTok is a fun place to find all kinds of really bad <laughs> videos. Uh, but I recreate them. I, I do love that. I do love that. I have a channel. It's it's Kenny Biddle CSI. And I literally go through all the paranormal videos that I find and I recreate them here. Um, so we reproduce the same effects so you can see how they're done because I show you what we do. Like I recreate it. You see the recreation first and then you see how I did it. Um, so you can understand it better and you, you know, when next time you see a video like that, you're like, 
I know how that was done. Okay. Oh, I, I so. wish we were neighbors. I just wish we were neighbors. <laughs> we have so much I, you, I would be such a pest. You would be like cussing me, like lock the door, keep him out. Like he's driving me crazy because this is my, that's my jam. That, that sounds it. like big fun to me. Oh, it is. It is. All right. Kenny Biddle, I'm going to include the SI link in the description box and you're fun and you're necessary. And I appreciate you talking to us about uh, these alleged paranormal and let's cross paths again soon. Okay. Absolutely. Good talking to you, Seth.